Welcome to this teaching with Craig Damone. Craig has ministered around the world, preaching cutting-edge revelation, which is changing cultures and building the kingdom of God. Craig is the founder and director of Ambassador Ministries, which majors in Bible teaching, healing ministry, world missions, relief projects, orphanages, and more. Now listen carefully as Craig brings to you revelation from God's Word. We're going to talk about divine healing. What I'm going to do today is to go back to square one, if you will, and hit some high points in this very broad biblical subject. Let's go into the subject of healing. If I was going to reduce my whole life's teaching on this topic so that I could hit some high points in just a few minutes, I might point back to a very simple outline the Lord gave me years ago while I was ministering at a minister's conference in Faisalabad, Pakistan. I'm going to share along these lines, and I know this will bless you. I'll also be adding other things from those notes. Now, let me give you an important key. Start with the Word. Continue in the Word. Start with the Word. Continue in the Word. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. We start with the Word. We continue with the Word. Our baseline for everything is the Word. We judge everything through the lens of God's Word. What the Word says goes. That's why we cannot judge whether or not someone is healed based on what we see, what we hear, what we feel, or any external evidence. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, We walk by faith and not by sight. Three times in the New Testament it says, The just shall live by faith. I'm referring to Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and Hebrews 10.38. Now we have no problem thinking that way when it comes to the new birth. We don't judge based on what we see. The Word says it, so we believe it. But somehow we change the rules for divine healing. You know, Romans 10, 9 and 10, probably the main scripture that I use when I'm leading somebody to salvation. It says, the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. Very clear. We just simply believe it, and we don't really have any external evidence. We just believe the evidence of the Word. But then when it comes to divine healing, we change the rules. Perhaps we don't want to have to confront the possibility that our faith did not make somebody well. Guess what? Your faith won't make anyone well anyway. Healing is already bought and paid for. It's a kingdom entitlement. If you're in the kingdom of God, healing is yours, just like the forgiveness of sins. Unfortunately, what happens is someone approaches a divine healing believer and says, please pray for me, I'm sick. We pray for them, and then if nothing visible happens, we have a tendency to say, well, I guess that person wasn't healed. And sometimes we'll come up with an excuse, why not? We'll even blame it on the person. But the problem with that is we're judging healing based on external evidence rather than on God's Word. God's Word says Jesus himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Matthew 8, 17. By whose stripes you were healed. 1 Peter 2.24. And that is just as much God's Word as Romans 10, 9 and 10. You see, when the Bible says, by whose stripes you were healed, it's saying you were healed. If you were healed, you are healed. Clear? If that's true, then our goal should never be to think, act, or say anything contrary to the Word. I know that nobody's been perfect in this area, but that should be our goal. John 7.24 says, Judge not according to the appearance 
but judge righteous judgment. Righteous judgment is judging according to what God says about our situation. And if the Word says it, it's true. If someone reports that they're not better after you pray for them, or maybe they even say that they're worse, are we going to believe that or believe the Word? Now, I'm not saying the person is trying to be deceptive. I'm just saying, what is our final authority? If you side with what you see, hear, or feel, the circumstances in someone's body will never change. But if you side with God, the circumstances have to change because God's Word is more powerful than the circumstances. I've learned this. When I confront sickness, either the sickness will back down or I'm going to back down one or the other. The issue with everything is the Word, not external evidence. So therefore, let me come back to my original premises that we start with the Word and continue with the Word. Also, we cannot judge whether or not someone is healed based on what we see, what we hear, what we feel, or any external evidence. We judge by the Word. Secondly, you are not healed based on anything that you do. This is so very important. It's important to understand you're not healed on the basis of your actions. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, which is often spoken of in relation to getting born again, says, For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now in this scripture, the word saved there, yes, it does apply to forgiveness of sins. Yes, it applies to being born again. But it's the Greek word sozo, and it's much broader than just forgiveness or entering into the kingdom of God. It also means healed. It also means delivered. It means preserved. It means made sound. It means to have everything that's in our redemption. We could just as easily say, for by grace are you healed through faith, and that not of yourselves. Listen to this. For by grace are you healed through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, I'm not changing the scripture at all. Many times that same word is translated healed instead of saved or salvation. And it's used many different ways because it is rich with meaning. So we could substitute the word healed there and it would mean the same thing. But if we understand that, we'll think differently about situations that we often encounter. That's where, like for example, somebody comes to us and says, please pray for so-and-so. They're sick with this chronic disease and they're such a good Christian. Or they'll even say, this person is a pastor. Or this person has served the Lord for 30 years, something like that. When I hear this, I want to say to that person, what's that got to do with them being healed? They may as well say, please pray for this person. They're sick with this chronic disease and they've lived a horrible life. They're a great sinner, a thief, a drug addict, whatever. You see, it's not about that person. Now, I realize that if our mind is clean and we're free of sin, then probably we're in a better position to receive, but a person's actions really have nothing to do with receiving any part of our redemption. I know that's hard for many religious ears to hear, but it's true anyway. It's not about you. It's about Jesus and what He has done for you. Now, there's those who think that God owes them healing. They say, God should heal me. I've been a faithful Christian. I've never missed a tithe. I've ushered in church. I've worked in the nursery. I've prayed for the pastor. And so if God's going to heal anybody, he's going to heal me. And yes, I've heard this or some variation thereof from many lips. And it's unfortunate. I've watched ordinary sinners get healed before the person who makes those kinds of assumptions. You know why? 
because the sinner knows they can't earn it. The good Christian is trying to earn it. Again, it's not about you. It's about what Jesus did for you. We are healed by grace through faith. To receive healing or minister healing, we need to get our minds off of ourselves and onto what God said and what Jesus did. May I share with you that one of the main reasons the enemy tries to attack us with sickness and disease is precisely to get us to be self-centered, to get us to think about ourselves. When you're sick, you're not waiting on other people. You're not praying for other people. You're not helping other people. You're not involved in working in the church. None of those things. God wants us to have our minds on the Lord. We become holy as we focus on Jesus. We become better as people as we look to Him, not look to ourselves. You know, we should do what Isaiah 53 verse 4 says. The first part of that verse says, Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Or a better translation is, Surely He has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. And this is something that many times people read right over. It says, Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Now, I know that this has been applied in different ways, but I want to just say to you that we are to esteem Jesus stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, not you. If you look to the cross in the same way that Moses lifted up the pole in the wilderness and people by looking at that snake on the pole were healed, in that same way we look at Jesus on the cross and we are healed by seeing him as the one stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So we are to get our minds off of ourselves and get our minds on what Jesus did for you. That is a recipe for receiving and ministering divine healing. Praise God. And let me just say this, as a divine healing minister, I don't heal because I'm better than anybody else. I'm not more qualified than anybody else except in the area of experience only in that area. It's not because I'm a better person. It's because I know that Jesus paid the price for every man, woman, boy, and girl on the face of the planet to be healed. Praise God. Now, one of the things some may ask is, if the price is already paid for healing, then why am I not healed? Allow me to approach that question from several angles. Now, there's some that spend a lot of time explaining why believers are not healed. The term roadblocks to healing or hindrances to healing is used a lot. But I take a slightly different view because, to me, if the Word says I'm healed, I'm healed. I'm not going to second-guess God's revelation in His Word. I know what people are talking about. They're really talking about manifestation of healing. They're talking about walking out their healing. I understand that. I get it. But if we want to learn to think and talk like God does, then we need to believe in the very core of our being that God's word is true and we simply can't change it because of what we see, hear, or feel. We've covered that earlier this week. That means we're healed. Regardless, it's already true. God has spoken it, and that establishes it, and that means it's reality right now. To Father God, establishment of truth is synonymous with present-day reality. Remember, God is timeless. So, when God says something, it's already come to pass as far as He's concerned. Amen. We live in the realm of time, and so we make statements about what is true and not true based on what's going on in this present time frame. That's not the way God thinks. We need to think with eternity in our hearts. After all, we're given eternal life when we came to know Jesus. Eternal life means that we think in eternal terms. Are you with me? But what people are really asking is, why don't I see my healing? So why don't people see their healing, something they already have manifested at times? Well, it's the same as provision. 
Your father takes care of the flowers of the field and the birds of the air without struggle. And he takes even better care of you. Redemptively, Jesus became poor so that through his poverty you might be made rich. That means you are rich right now. Now, if you're unable to pay your bills, there's a disconnect between the provision of God in his word and your experience. That disconnect is what we call unbelief. Either you're walking out your salvation, fully believing what God said, or you're in unbelief. With that said, I want to talk about unbelief for just a moment from Romans chapter 17. You know, the only reason that Jesus ever gave his disciples for somebody not being healed is because of unbelief. And it wasn't the unbelief of the person who needed the healing. It was unbelief of the people that were ministering the healing. So as a divine healing minister, which we all are, because we can all go lay hands on the sick and see them recover, we need to remember that we need to stay free of unbelief. That goes back to the premises that I began with on Monday, where I'm talking about not judging by external evidence, but judging only by the Word of God. What is true to us should be the Word of God over and above what people are experiencing. Amen. But in Matthew 17, we're talking about the story where Jesus and the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, came down from the mountain, and down in that valley, they found the other disciples with a man who had a boy that was demon-possessed and causing him great grief, causing him great stress, trying to get him to commit suicide, and made him sick. That's what we're talking about. And the disciples were not getting the job done for the first time since they'd been commissioned to the ministry of divine healing and deliverance back in Matthew chapter 10. In verse 18 of Matthew 17, it says, Jesus rebuked the devil. The disciples didn't do it, so Jesus had to do it. Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And the word cured lets us know this was not just a deliverance, but also a healing. You can look that word up. It means what we think it means. Verse 19, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why couldn't we cast him out? Verse 20, Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. He didn't give them a lot of excuses. He didn't talk about what the father did or didn't do, what the boy did or didn't do. He says, because of your unbelief. And he was talking directly to his disciples. And then he goes on and says, For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. Now Jesus was not saying they didn't have this grain of mustard seed. He was saying that their unbelief worked against the faith that they had. Now, I might as well go ahead and read verse 21. That's something that sometimes hangs people up. It says in verse 21, Howbeit, this kind doesn't go out, but by prayer and fasting. If you didn't know any better, you would think that Jesus gave two different answers. One being because of your unbelief, and the second, you haven't prayed and fasted enough. That is not what he was saying. He didn't contradict himself. The reason was because of your unbelief. I'll get to the prayer and fasting in just a moment. Now, the greatest reason for God's people not manifesting everything they've received in their redemption is unbelief. Unbelief. Now, it may be in their case, it may be in the case of those ministering to the person that needs the healing. But the number one reason and the only reason that Jesus gave was unbelief. Praise God. Notice, though, he didn't say it takes a lot of faith to move a mountain. It just takes a mustard seed. But oftentimes the unbelief works against the faith. That's the problem. If your faith is going one direction, your unbelief is pulling in the wrong direction, you're not going anywhere. You're staying right where you are. 
Praise God. Do you understand that? Now, as far as fasting and prayer is concerned, what he said was, this kind goes not out but by prayer and fasting. The assumption that people often wrongly make is that he was saying that this kind of demon does not go out by prayer and fasting. That's not what he was saying. He was saying this kind of unbelief doesn't go out but by prayer and fasting. In other words, to be free of unbelief, you need to pray, you need to fast, because we need faith in order to do our job for the master. But prayer aids our faith, and fasting aids our prayer. Are you getting this? So faith, prayer, and fasting all go together. Amen. Uh, I have a lot more teaching on that subject if you're interested, but I'm going to go on here. Notice also beyond the unbelief is fear, or we could say fear is the reason for unbelief. Either way we say it, fear also plays a big factor in why people are not seeing the manifestation of their healing. Now, if you watch the news all day and you listen to all the statistics about the coronavirus, you're working against the force of faith. Believe me, you're worried because of what you're seeing and hearing. Chances are you may even attract sickness and disease because sickness and disease are attracted to fear like bugs are attracted to light. Other sources of fear could be the words of our unbelieving relatives and friends, the way we were raised, books we read, and sometimes even those books that we pick up trying to get healthy. Also, it could be wrong mental training when we were growing up. People telling us, you better be careful, you better watch out. (laughs) It can also simply be harassment from the enemy who reminds us of what happened to us the last time you felt that way or your family's medical history, or any of these kinds of things. You know, it's good to think about these things from time to time, to analyze our emotions and what kinds of thought patterns are behind those emotions, or to take a look at the thought patterns themselves. Praise God. Now, I'm not saying that if you have one or more of these factors working against you, that you are necessarily in unbelief. But if you're battling with fear or unbelief, then you may want to cut off the source and listen intently to only what the Word says until you overcome the fear and unbelief. Now, I understand that you may have a job that requires you to know what's going on in the news, for example. But regardless, we don't live by that. We live and walk by faith, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So we get informed through whatever sources that we need to get the information we need to complete our assignment, but we live by the Word of God. Clear? Amen. Let me explain one more factor in failing to manifest the divine healing that you already, as a believer, possess right now. And I'm going to do my best with this, but this needs to be said. It's failing to possess your own temple, or put another way, not taking care of your body. God made the human body so resilient that it essentially made itself all by itself from a single cell. That's how much intelligence he programmed into you when your parents engaged in procreation. God knew you even before you were born, but he didn't specifically create you. He created Adam, then took Eve out of Adam, and from there, mankind for thousands of years procreated. That is, they cooperated with God in filling and subduing the earth with more and more people. Without your parents' help, God could not have made you. Did you ever realize that? We say, well, God made me. That's true, but God needed somebody's help. Also, without God, your parents could never have procreated. So, God, your mother, your father, they were all involved in making you who you are physically and even in some other ways. You say, well, I don't have a problem with that, but what does that have to do with manifesting divine healing? Follow me here. Just like your parents cannot procreate and your body would not have developed sufficiently to be birth ready through a different process than what God designed, 
so your body today cannot be sustained in a healthy manner, allowing for God's will and design for longevity through a process other than what God designed. He has a way, a method, a process. Your body was designed for certain kinds of fuel every single day. Let me remind you that most of the healing you experience actually doesn't happen when you feel sick. Your body has ongoing internal processes taking place every day that rejuvenate cells, carry waste out of the body, revitalize your skin, your arteries, your veins, and recycle dead material. This also is healing. In order for the body to function naturally and optimally at peak performance, it requires good physical maintenance. Usually, when people are asking for prayer for healing, it's to correct a lack of good physical maintenance. In other words, there are certain God-given functions and processes that are not being honored. It may have to do with something like sleep, exercise, or mental attitude. But the most basic building block of health, the foundation of good physical maintenance, is your nutrition. Now, if you come asking for prayer, God is merciful, He's gracious, He's going to heal you. Don't worry about that. He's not going to say, well, you got to go clean up your diet and then you come for healing. No, He heals you. And then, like Jesus told some that were sick because they had been in sin, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. This is kind of along those same lines. A lot of times, divine healing believers get the idea that to get a proper understanding along these lines means they are not trusting God for their health and healing. Well, if you're approaching the subject incorrectly from a carnal standpoint, that could be true. But remember, the Holy Spirit was given to guide us into all the truth. And that includes truth about what we eat, what we drink, exercise, lifestyle, the quality of our air and water, and on and on and on. Divine healing is not designed to be a substitute for divine health. They work together. Divine health is a whole lot bigger than getting sick and then being healed. Getting sick and then being healed over and over again. I'll say it again. Divine healing is not designed to be a substitute for divine health. Praise God. Let me talk about nutrition for just a moment. Now, I haven't strayed from my subject, and this is not a so-called secular subject. This is a biblical subject. Did you know that the Bible specifically talks about good meat and bad meat, overconsumption of sweets, eggs, milk, salt, and a whole lot more? If you didn't know that, it may be that you just need more instruction about how to read your Bible because you've read right over the passages which contain this information and you assume they have a spiritual application only when God is saying something to us about the natural. God is very practical. The Bible is very practical. Not every subject is covered in the Bible, but I suggest the Bible covers a lot more than we often give it credit for. Further, Scripture covers why our food needs supplementation. By explaining to us that due to the fall of man, the soil, and remember that our bodies were made from soil, the soil is corrupt. And the more time that has passed in human history, the worse it's gotten. For good health, you need the nutrients found in the soil. But you don't get all of them in any square inch of soil on planet Earth anymore. As the Bible says in Proverbs 25, verse 2, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. So let's study. Remember, the Bible calls us kings and priests. As priests, we represent man to God, but as kings, we represent God to man by exercising dominion over the earth. Let me repeat what I said earlier. Our bodies are made from soil, and we need nutrients from the soil in order to sustain physical life. Specifically, 60 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 amino acids, 2 fatty acids, at least every day. 
If you want to know more about that, contact me. Our website is ambassadorministries.org. Because we've not been properly scripturally trained, when the Holy Spirit begins to give us instruction about something we really need to be doing for our bodies, we ignore it. If that's true with you, my friend, let today be a turning point. Minister healing to yourself when you need it. Let others agree with you. But listen to the Holy Spirit who will guide you into the truth of what you need to maintain your body. He may tell you, drink more water. You're not getting enough salt. He may say, get more sunlight. Find a good vitamin D supplement. He's given me instructions like this, and I chose this example to give you today. When I started to have summer allergy symptoms two or three years back, I knew I lacked something in my body, so I asked the Lord for wisdom. He said, double up on your EFAs, and I knew what he meant. He meant essential fatty acids, omega-3s, omega-6s, omega-9s. I would never have thought of that, but a couple of days of that, and all symptoms disappeared. We know God designed our bodies to live for at least 120 years. Science confirms that. So why doesn't it happen very often? As a matter of fact, Christians on average live only a few months longer than non-Christians. Why? I'm giving you the answer. For even spirit-filled believers, that's true. I don't believe in so many cases we lack faith. I believe we lack good common sense, biblical sense, spiritual sense, physical sense. However you want to say it, we lack good sense. We've neglected our bodies. We don't practice all the bad vices the world does, but we've got vices of our own because we don't know how to listen to God. Selah. God made us a certain way, and he designed us to function a certain way. He'll restore us, he'll heal us, but we need to operate according to God's rules. And the Bible has a lot to say about nutrition in particular, since that's the foundation of physical maintenance on a daily basis. Praise God. Now, as we prepare to pray the prayer of faith, I want you to consider the bedrock promises, no, the bedrock facts that are in God's Word speaking about your healing. Many are listening today and you're thinking, I need healing. I need something fixed in my physical body. Well, listen to this. It says in Matthew 8, 17, that what Jesus did by healing the sick and casting out demons was to fulfill the words of Isaiah that says, He himself took our infirmities, and bore our sicknesses. Praise God. You know, that could not be more clear. Just like Jesus took our sins in his own body on the tree, Jesus took in his body the wounds necessary to pay the price for your healing. Therefore, it belongs to you. Also, 1 Peter 2.24, you know it. It says, by his stripes you were healed. If you were healed, you are healed. We're just appropriating, we're just manifesting what is already done as a result of the new birth. And when we received the new birth, we received everything that was in our redemption. There's nothing that we can do to qualify for it, nothing we can do to earn it. It is ours. Hallelujah. Praise God. So let me pray right now those scriptures. Father, in the name of Jesus, your word says that Jesus took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. We declare in the name of Jesus that that was sufficient for our healing, that what he took, we're not going to take, and what he bore, we're not going to bear, because instead, we are going to honor the sacrifice that Jesus already made for us. He took our place. Praise God. And your word also says that righteousness means that by whose stripes, by his stripes, by Jesus' stripes, we were healed, or by his wound, we were healed. 
Praise God. It's already done. Your word declares it. We say that your word is more true than the ground on which we are standing, than the earth around us, than the symptoms in our body, than the circumstances that we are facing. That is what is real to us. Therefore, in Jesus' name, by the authority given to me as a son of God, as a minister of God, I declare to every sickness, disease, infirmity, weakness, and pain, go now in Jesus' name, never to return. Get your hands off of God's property. Praise God. God's been dealing with me about three different conditions that are out there that people are being healed of. And he gave it to me in two word phrases. Number one, cracking knees. Number two, hardening back. Number three, dizzy head. Now let me go through that. First of all, cracking knees. Somebody, your knees are cracking. The bones are cracking and it's very painful. You don't want to have to have an operation. I declare you're healed. I declare that those bones are being reconstructed in Jesus' name. Hardening of the back. I see a man who is bent over and you're getting that way more and more, but there's a hardening that's taking place, not only with the bones, but also with the flesh surrounding those bones, but you're being healed right now. I said also dizzy head. I don't mean that as a derogatory term. I'm really talking about vertigo. You have dizziness that's extreme and is excruciating in your head, but you're being delivered right now. Now be sure to send me your testimony. I thank you so much for listening. Be sure to be in touch with me. I love you in Jesus' name. God bless you. You have reached the end of this teaching by Craig DeMoe. You can contact Craig by writing to Ambassador Ministries, P.O. Box 19561, Portland, Oregon 97280. Be sure to let him know what this teaching is meant to you. And when you write, include your testimonies and prayer requests. Ambassador Ministries is sustained by the faithfulness of God through our partners and friends. We welcome your tax-deductible contributions to this outreach ministry. We pray over every gift. If you want to find out more about partnership in this exciting ministry, let us know. Again, the address is Ambassador Ministries, P.O. Box 19561, Portland, Oregon, 97280. The ministry web address is ambassadorministries.net. That's ambassadorministries.net. May God richly bless you.